right, welcome to another edition of Front Porch Conversations here at Advent Christian Village. Today I'm excited about our guest, and that's Ed Smith. And Ed, you live in Dowling House, is that right? That's right. Good. Well, I uh, hope you'll uh, stay with us throughout this time together. And um, Ed, tell us a little bit about where your life began. And I was born in Michigan in a little town called Waterville. Say that again, please. Waterville. Okay. Actually, there's two towns kind of close together. It's Waterville and Coloma. Parents and everybody lived in Coloma, but the hospital was in Waterville. And my grandfather's farm was in Waterville. So that's where I was born. And when I was, I wasn't sure about the age, but my sister told me later on that we went into foster care when I was two. And I, we stayed in foster care all the way up until I was 16. And I went in the Army. But she stayed in foster care all the way to 18 and, and then got out on her own. But Were you I, able to be together in foster care? For a while. We got split up at the last point. And that's where I ended up going, to, going with people. I ended up in Illinois for a while and then went to Wisconsin. So that's those three little loop right there is where I had my start and everything at. Uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin is where I went in the Army at. So. Do you have special memories of childhood you'd want to share? Not Th really like that much. Uh, I, only, I, I was in several foster homes, and I don't remember a lot of them, but I do remember most of them were farms, and I figured out since I've gotten older why I was there. Work! <clears throat> And the state paid them to keep me, so I worked. <laughs> so uh, they, uh, this, that's a couple children's homes I was in. One was a Baptist children's home, and the other one was run by the American Legion. My d dad at the time got in. And he was the one to put us in foster care because my mother had a severe stroke or something and wasn't able to take care of us. So that's how we ended up in foster care. Of course, my sister... Got, I think held a grudge against my dad for doing that for years. But he drove a truck back in those days. And it'd take a week to come to Florida. Where we, nowadays you can run it just 18 hours or 19, 24 hours at the most. And a week down here to get rid of his load, a week to pick up a load and then go back. He couldn't have two kids. I understood that because I got into the trucking business. Mm -hmm. And I understood why he did it. And I used a lot of everything I went through as a learning tool, a stepping tool to learn how to live my life. Everybody said, you know, nowadays they get, I, I see you up, they got to teach kids how, and people how to be parents and teach them how to do all sorts of things. I never had parents to teach me how to be a parent, but I learned somewhere and I don't know where that came from. But my daughter's grown up. She's going to love this. She's 50 now. <laughs> she won't see this, but anyhow. But she's 50, and she's doing just fine. She's got, gone to college, got everything, you know. Mm -hmm. And she, she pretty well uh, taken care of herself and her family. And, of course, her husband's helping. She's the main breadwinner in her family because she's got the college education and uh, got the paperwork to be able to do a good job at what she does. Mm -hmm. So that's how that goes. Well, it's always good when we, our kids turn out that way. Yeah. We appreciate it. Actually, i got to say, a lot of people, when they see her around there, said I did a good job of raising her. I said, no, my wife did the job. Because I was all, I was California, Seattle, Portland, Tacoma. You know, I was all over the place. Mm -hmm. I'd come home, be there three days, and leave again. So I wasn't around much. Well, I, you had said earlier that you had gone in the Army. Yep. Tell us about that, please. Well, I did the, I did the uh, hitch deal with, uh, where you spent three years active duty, and, I, and this was in 1963. I went to Germany. I don't know why. I was a prime candidate for it now, but I went to Germany. Then I did my three years uh, reserve for the U.S. Army. Then I did three years Army National Guard out of Jacksonville, Florida. And that gave me nine years total altogether. So, and that was education because 
I was put in charge of a group of guys, and I, you know, had to do all the paperwork and everything, and I, I couldn't do it worth a hoot. So I had a guy that was good at paperwork, and he took care of it. Cheated a little bit, I guess, on that, but it it all worked out pretty good. And I, I went in the Army a private, came out a sergeant. You can't knock that. No, you can't. Not in that length of time. So. Uh, and so I, Germany was your only overseas assignment. Yep. I enjoyed it. it and it, that, to me, was my college education because I, I got to see a lot of things over there between Spain, Portugal, Luxembourg, Denmark, uh, Holland, East Germany, West Germany, <laughs> and England. I got to travel Italy, Switzerland. I, I drove through all those countries because uh, I worked for a major that every time he had a meeting somewhere, he called me up to the brigade headquarters, and I got a Monday and said, Wednesday, I've got a meeting in uh, with someplace in Italy. I, I could leave then and drive to Italy. I either drove his Jeep or his sedan, whichever vehicle he wanted. And on the way, I got to sightsee, because it didn't take that long to get across all them places. But that was my education, and I think that, was, that helped me a lot, a lot of things to learn how to get along with people stuff like that. And I enjoyed it. I, to me, uh, I think every kid, if he doesn't go on to college, ought to spend a minimum of two years in the military. They need to do away with that. Some, some of the high-tech stuff, they need to cut it down a little bit for some of these people, if nothing to learn the discipline. Because I'll tell you, when I went in, I was 16, just turned 17 going through. I was a little on the cocky side. But some of them people taught me real quick I wasn't as bad as I thought I was. <laughs> and that served you well? Oh, right. yeah. <laughs> Got that right. I learned to listen to somebody when they say something. When you got out of the Army, what was your next employment? Well, I sort of bummed around because I, I often tell people I didn't have my head screwed on my shoulder straight. But when I got out, I went to work. I ended up in Jacksonville, Florida. But to tell you this, I met a gal in Paris, France. Her mother lived over there, and she, but they were from Florida. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got her name and address. I dated her for a while over there. And then when I got back here, I bummed around a little bit, and I ended up in Jacksonville, Florida. And I had her name and number here, and I called her, and we started dating. After a year, we got married and started our family. And then uh, I had some small jobs around there because I had to get planted, you know, mm -hmm. residency and all that other stuff. And most of them didn't pay where they were, but then I went to work for a company that had some big, pretty trucks that I liked. <laughs> <laughs> and I was loading and unloading them. Then I went from loading and unloading them to spotting trailers in the yard. Then I went from spotting trailers in the yard to hooking up trailers for the senior drivers. All they had to do was get in and drive off. So what does spotting a trailer mean? Putting it up to the dock. You, with, oh, okay. They come along with a list. They say, uh, here's a list of trailers that are loaded. You've got to put them in the yard. Here's a list of trailers that are empty on the yard. you got to put them up to the dock so we can load them. So you learn how to back on up no, without any problem in a short time. Mm -hmm. And then you, I started pulling inspections on the truck, checking everything out. So when the senior drivers came in, the inspection sheet was done. They're all set. All oh, they had to get in the truck and drive off. And then I, on weekends and holidays, I load a road with a senior driver. And all I did was unload his truck and fuel it, keep it washed and all that, that stuff. And as, I, as the years went, year went on, I was with him a year. As the year went on, he slowly, because he was running South Florida, he'd let me drive the interstates coming back up towards Jacksonville to get used to it. And uh, I did that for quite a while. And then finally, uh, one day I was sitting in the driver's room and the transportation manager came in and he looked at me and said, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm waiting on Lewis. He said, Lewis isn't coming today. I said, well, who's going to pull his run? He said, you are. I like to have a cardiac seizure, <laughs> but I pulled the run and everything came out all right. So they ended up putting me on what they called a, an extra driver board, which you got to start out in you know, somewhere. And I, 
you'd be sitting at home at five o'clock, you'd call them up and they'd say, no, we don't have anything. So, okay. Well, 9.30, they call, we got an overload on a truck. We need you to run to Charleston or Columbia or someplace like that. So you had to be prepared to go at all times, regardless. You didn't mess yourself up, you know, where you couldn't drive. Because on that extra board, you never knew when you were going to be called. Mm -hmm. I have been called at uh, 8 o'clock on a Friday night to run to Palmer, Massachusetts to pick something up, have it back in Jacksonville Monday morning so they can distribute it. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, that, that's just something you do when you're starting out. And it took me a good number of years of driving that kind of stuff, doing that, running all over the country to where, and, and even though I had trouble filling out paperwork, and the, the, they maneuvered it so I didn't, a lot of things were covered anyhow. And that's the way that went, and that's, that company, I pulled doubles and triples for so it was interesting. What was the longest run you would do? Well, for one company, I used to run from Jacksonville to California every week. Uh, leave Jacksonville on a Saturday, deliver in Tucson, or deliver Phoenix on a Monday, Santa Ana on a Tuesday, reload in Salinas on Wednesday, be back in Jacksonville Friday morning because the stuff I brought out of Salinas had to go on a shipping container to go to the Bahamas. And it sailed out of Jacksonville port at 2 o'clock Friday afternoon. So you had to be back. You couldn't miss that time. Nope. But I did that all by myself for quite a while. And then uh, the boss got in a little bit of trouble and he finally had to team, every, team those trucks up that were running out there. Mm -hmm. There were several of us doing it, but we'd see each other coming and going on the road. But that's all over. I've run, in, I run every state, I, even Canada. I've run into Canada. Uh, I, I don't know how it, for sure, but I think I've been into Mexico once or twice. <laughs> On purpose? Well, yeah. They, <laughs> that was I, a part of your run. <laughs> yeah, one company I went up there. All they give you is a stick map and tell you where to go. And I'm sitting out in the middle of nowhere, you know, 50 miles from the nearest town. And all of a sudden I look and I see this cloud of dust coming. I said, what in the world is that? Well, as it gets closer, I realize it's a truck. When it pulls up to me, about eight Mexicans got out of the thing. They opened the doors on my trailer, opened the doors on their trailer, backed them up, unloaded my stuff onto their stuff and left. And that's nobody signed the paperwork. So I eased back into town, the nearest town I could get to, and I called the boss and told him what had happened. He said, well, hang on a minute. So he called his boss, who called the boss elsewhere. He said, yeah, everything's fine. They got everything. They're happy. I said, I'm sure glad to land. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are the lessons you learned as a truck driver? Are any experiences you want to share with us? People out there on the road can get real strange at night most of the time. Seems like. I can't say that on TV, can I? <laughs> <laughs> you can edit this one out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it seems like see to their vehicle, they lose their minds. And, and there was a lot of that going on. And there's so many people haven't got the foggiest idea where they're at out there. So if they are involved in something drastic, and they do call somebody on the cell phone, if they don't have that, well, now they got GPS and all that, they couldn't tell them where they're at. I mean... Be aware of your surroundings and where you're at when you're out there. Because you've got some places, you've got miles and miles and miles of nothing. Mm -hmm. you know. But there are them little road markers out there. You keep track of them and you know where you're at. And there are people who break down. They're driving vehicles and they haven't got the slightest idea. Half of them don't have road service anywhere or anything like that. And it's just, the road is, is a hazardous place. You've got to watch it. I did it for 34 years. Yes, I was involved in a few accidents, but none of them were ever charged to me. It was people not using their heads. But uh, other than that, that's, that's about the way that goes out there. You just got to watch your surroundings and be careful. Now, when you start pulling into some of these towns, like you go into uh, New York, uh, New York got some bad places to go into. You got to be very careful what you're doing there. Uh, same thing with New Orleans. 
uh, I know one time I, I parked a truck in New Orleans. I had to make a drop the next morning, and I, I parked it down there near the Superdome. And uh, I was going to get some old guy on the street there to keep an eye on it for me. Well, I paid him $5, and that was probably $2.98 too much. But I went and went into town, went down to Bourbon Street and around, saw New Orleans. Mm -hmm. Well, when I came back, I asked him, I said, is everything okay in the truck? He said, everything's fine. I said, fine. So I went up to the truck, I unlocked the door, got up in it, sat down, and I looked. CB was gone, AM, FM radio was gone, TV in the sleeper was gone. I said, what do you mean everything was fine? <laughs> Somebody come and clean this thing yeah. out. You know, that's just how that went. But <clears throat> things like that happen. Mm -hmm. But uh, you learn how to get along with a lot of them. It's just every town you got to watch yourself and know where you're going. Be careful. It's like one time in Chicago, I picked up a load and I was... Gonna, I'm headed west with the load, but I coming out as I drove around corners. I noticed a car following me, and I kept alert. I, finally, I came up to an all-night uh, diner that was there, and I said, "Well, it'd be a good time for me to get a cup of coffee and everything." So I pulled the truck over to the side. The car pulled over right behind me. So I thought, "Well, I better find out who there." I got out my thing to check my tires with. I walked around the truck. When I got to the back. I saw it was an elderly couple in the car, so I went back and asked them, I said, are y'all all right? They said, oh yeah. I said, well, uh, where are you going? She said, well, we're going to follow you back to Florida, because <laughs> I had a Florida tag on the truck. And I said, I'm not going to Florida, I'm going to California. And they were in the pain, well, how, how, do, we get, how do we get on the road to, California, to Florida? So I had to get them on the right interstate, going the right way and everything like that. Hopefully they made it, mm -hmm. but that's things like that happen out there. A lot of times you've got control over what takes place. Sometimes you don't have control. Uh, sometimes you. Um, did you live in Jacksonville the whole time you were driving? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I lived in I, uh, I lived in Jacksonville from nineteen sixty six. I think it was because I was in the Army Reserve unit there, and then I went to the National Guard unit there, all the way up to, well, my wife passed away in 93. And then I stayed in the same house, and I had my daughter and all that. Uh, my daughter had moved out, and she and another girl were sharing a house together, and it was more than they could handle, so I told her, I said, why don't you come back here and live in this house? So I stayed gone 90% of the time. And so I... I got to the point to where uh, I slept days. They were gone most of the time during the day. Then I was gone at night. They were at the house. And I come, a lot of time, like one Friday, I came in off of a run, and the dispatcher told me, he said, we're not going to need you tonight. So I got in my pickup truck, and I took off. I don't know where I drove to. I just, because after my wife died, I didn't want to go home. Mm -hmm. So I just drove around. Well, I'd come back home Monday morning and I had to sleep all day so I could run out Monday night. And I'd drive up in the driveway and there stands my daughter with her hands on her hips. Where have you been? I said, why? She said, you had got to start letting me know where you're at and where you, what time you're going to be home. I said, I can remember asking a 16-year-old that and never got an answer. So, the tables got turned, didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> so that's how that went. And it was... You know, it, it was neat in a way, but it, it was it was good. And then I met another lady, and we ended up getting married. And she thought she was gonna, I was gonna take care of her. And then I had this little problem that I've got crop up. And I don't know, doctors have never gave it a real name. Uh, finally, one doctor at the VA hung a stroke on it, but everybody up to that point called it an episode which I always thought was next week's TV show. Mm -hmm, right. And this is an episode two today. <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't know if she got to the point where she didn't want to uh, look after me or something like that. So I, she sent me to my daughter's house. I, my daughter said, well, we'll get a place for you. Get one of them uh, uh, mobile buildings or something mm -hmm. like that because they had a big, some property and I could put, put it, they were going to put it up on me. 
And I told her, I said, no. I said, we need to find a place for me. So I, I, I told her, I said, she said, why? And I said, well, you've got two kids. You don't need a third one. So uh, she hunted around, and she knew a lady from St. Mary's, Georgia, whose mother was living down here. And so uh, she talked about She looked on the computer all over the place. And when she got done, she said, Dad, I think you will be happiest at the Advent Christian Village and you wouldn't be anywhere else. So she drove me down here. We took a tour of everything. And uh, went back. We talked about it and everything like that. And meanwhile, I decided to divorce my uh, ex-wife that dumped me. And uh, so she, uh, so, uh, she had, had all the paperwork done and everything, and I was getting ready to move in down here because they were going to put me in a room that had a tub and all kinds of grab animals. I said, well, that'd be good. Well, I think it was Thursday, a week before I was to move in down here, Karen Thompson called and told my daughter we had a room with a walk-in shower. My daughter said, we'll take it. And Karen said, well, I don't know where it's located. My daughter said, I don't care where it's located. It's a walk-in shower. We'll take it. <laughs> so I moved in here on the 15th of October, 2010. And I plan to stay here the whole time. I'm not going anywhere. I'm glad of that, Ed. I like the people. I like the facility. You're not trapped in a room. You can get out and do things. You can get involved as much as you want to. And, of course, you know what I do. <laughs> Well, I want you to tell you, I want to tell the viewers one thing. Ed is one of the few people that I know that moved to the village and told us how he was going to volunteer. And he had a plan, and so will you tell him about what you do and how you do it? Well, I do roadside cleanup. Now, they, they like to call it grounds beautification, but whether, whether you want to put a high cover on it or a low, it's trash pickup alongside the road. But I do it early in the morning. It's like this morning I went out from 2 to 4. And well, 2 4 30, I think it was. And pick it up. I got a golf cart that's got all kinds of lights on it. It lights up the countryside just fine. And I can see what I'm doing, and I like doing it. And I also help for events that have got traffic, need traffic things, because I got flashing lights on my golf cart, slow traffic down, direct people where they need to go. And I think that's, to me, I try to help the village in that way. Keep the grounds clean because you're going to have one chance of making a first impression. Uh, and, and it's not that difficult to do. And that, that's something I enjoy doing because early in the morning, it's me and the Lord out there. And I talk to him while I'm, while I'm doing it. Oh, I forget. There's some varmints out there, too, but they're okay. They know you pretty well now, huh? Yeah. Well, Ed, you brought up something I'd like to ask you about. When did you first start talking to the Lord or he talking to you? That is a story. <laughs> Takes a while. I was driving up 75 one night, about 2 or 3 in the morning, and I can't remember if I fell asleep or what happened, but I found myself in the medium strip. And when I pulled my truck back up, I didn't panic or anything, but I pulled the truck back up on the interstate. Back in those days, the traffic wasn't heavy. So I got all the way on the right side, and I got out of the truck, and my knees buckled, and I went down by that front tire. And as plain as day, I heard this voice tell me, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess, Jesus Christ is Lord. And I said, yeah, right. I looked around, said, okay. So I went where I was going to make my delivery, and I came back to Jacksonville. The boss said, we're going to send you up to Bristol, Tennessee. I said, okay. So as I went up through Asheville, and I was crossing over the mountain, and coming down the other side, my air warning light went on. And it was a cold, drizzly night, rain, and that engine was tacking out of the frame on it. And I said, oh, Lord, I can't handle this. Everything got quiet, warm, comfortable, and I was scared, I was scared to death to look in that right-hand seat because there was somebody over there. Well, the next thing I knew, Six miles down the road, there's a little shell fuel stop. I was sitting there just as straight as an arrow. Type brakes weren't smoking, nothing. I got out of the truck and I went down on my knee again. Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. I said, okay. 
Well, I went to the phone and called my wife at 3 o'clock in the morning, which didn't go over big. I said, I'm going to church with you Sunday. And that's when I started. That was 1972. I got saved in April 1972. And when, no, the Lord's had his hand on me, even though a lot of things I did, you wouldn't know it. But I enjoyed it and know why he was with me. And that's how I got started. And that's, I got involved in truck stop ministries that way. Became a chaplain at the truck stop out at Baldwin. And I had a sort of an unusual way because I, I put the gospel of God to the way people, drivers, would understand it in their language. And uh, a lot of them would be rude, crude, and abusive to a lot of people. I mean, that, that, that's just the way it goes. And uh, so I, I, that's the way I walked with the Lord and, and started that way with them. And, and I, I sure, I enjoyed it, being, helping drivers out and stuff like that. And it was worked out pretty good. And the Lord helped me because I could not have done what I did. I wasn't good at speaking in front of people. Yeah, sometimes we might have only have two or three drivers there. Sometimes we had five, six, seven, eight. Sometimes we had a full house, which would be up to 20. But it all, all depended on the, you know, what drivers were there and things like that. What, you want to share with our viewers what you told me bef just before we started about how you compared? Oh, yeah. Well, being saved is like being dispatched. When you, when you call your dispatch on the phone and it gives you a, a, a destination to go to and pick up a load or something like that, you open up your atlas and find out where you're going. Well, two other things you got to do. You got to pull an inspection on the, your vehicle. Well, when you get saved, you pull an inspection on yourself. Make sure you, 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 your conscience is clean. Make sure you haven't uh, offended anybody. And if you have, ask for forgiveness for it. Even if those people aren't around anymore, you don't see them. You can ask for the Lord that I need to be forgiven for this stuff. And then open up that Bible and see where you're at and what routes you're going to take. Because granted, we're going to all make mistakes because we're human. Mm -hmm. And you do that. I've done that in the truck. I found me a route and say, oh, this one's shorter. And I'll be taking that route around all of a sudden. I'm up two miles from the road that I need. And there's an underpass there that says 12 6, and I'm 13 foot high. <laughs> what do you do? Turn around, go back, and start over again. <laughs> Your walk with Christ a lot of times is the same way. Don't give up. Keep trying. Keep Him in mind at all times, and He will walk with you. And that's, that's what I found out. Ed, thank you so much for coming and sitting down with me today. And I thank you for saying yes after you said no. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, viewers, for watching today. I'm glad you joined us. And look for future uh, shows of Front Porch Conversations. Thanks.